Greetings geologist. We are here to learn about the rock cycle today and the pieces and parts of the earth. So this kind of corresponds with chapter one of your textbook. Quite frankly, the earth has dramatically changed over its 4.56 billion years worth of history. How has it changed? The crust has changed. We've had plate tectonics where plates smash together, they pull apart. We've had ocean basins close an open mountain ranges get uplifted and eroded down. This is a constant state of change that we have. All right, what do you see in this picture? And I want you just to kind of think about it for a second, maybe even hit pause, and look at the river basin there. That's actually in Iceland, and it may look like something out of The Hobbit. But nevertheless, if you will uh, look at all the rivers and you will see the kind of great gigantic gouge that looks like this with almost a U-shaped profile that came from glaciers, the black rock you see is lava. Really what you're seeing is a crack in the earth where the earth is separating in Iceland called a mid-oceanic ridge. And it's really a rift zone, which is important because it's where two plates, continental plates, pull apart. So I see a lot of uh, geology happening there. Rock cycle where rocks are being made, they're being broken down, uh, and that leads to the development of new rocks in soil. All right, let's take a look at what the uh, earth is made out of. There's three distinctive layers. There's the inside core, which is the most dense of the three layers substantially because it's made of iron and nickel. Then we have what makes up a bulk of the earth's mass, which is the mantle. To most of us, the mantle seems like it should be a soupy mixture of uh, fluids. Uh, magma is not just like runny lava like you see at the surface. It's semi-solid rock that actually flows. It's more like plastic that's really, really hot. There's parts of it that have mantle plumes, which are more magmatic, uh, and then they rise to the surface because they're less dense than the rock uh, that is around that area, the mantle. Then we got the little bitty crustal part, which is where we are, and it seems like that's all that exists on Earth because that's where we live. So we're going to take a look at each part today and talk about their differences in composition, their differences in age, because those are important test-related issues you need to know. All right, something you need to be aware of is that the Earth has some composition changes, but we didn't always know that. We assumed the Earth was pretty much made of the same materials from top to bottom to the inside, from one side of the uh, world in North America to the other side in China, until we discovered using seismic wave technology that it was not made out of all the same material. So these two places in the earth where we know the composition is radically different is one is between the base of our oceanic and continental crust touching the top of the mantle and the second one is way way down inside the earth where the outer core touches the base of the mantle. We're going to be looking at each one. So how do we know these composition changes were really there? because uh, we've not been able to drill down that deep. In spite of what the movie The Core says, um, we really haven't made it down very far, literally about six to eight kilometers. All right, so what is the inside of the Earth made of? Really, uh, we discovered this by using some testing of P and S waves, which are seismic waves. P waves stand for primary waves, S stand for secondary waves. Uh, P waves and S waves travel in the interior of the Earth. That's why they're called body waves. So the deal is that P waves travel through solids, liquids, and gases, where S waves only travel through solids. That's important because if S waves hit liquid, then they should deflect off. Well, that is what we discovered as scientists. So if we could simulate that in a lab setting for any kind of element or material we have and know kind of like the signature pattern of that PNS wave, then we can tell you what the interior of the earth is. So it'd be kind of like you uh, having a driver's license or your credit card and they look at your signature and it doesn't match what you normally have. It may not go through. So you could assume that that's the same kind of correlation to how we look at PNS wave behavior patterns. In doing this, we discovered that the inside of the earth had uh, two parts of the core. A solid inner core, because remember P waves can travel through any kinds of material, including liquids but S waves cannot. And since we know what P waves uh, little signature pattern looks like through iron and nickel, we discovered that that was what the interior of the earth was made. So let's take a look at a little bit about those two composition changes differences. The first one is called the Mahovric discontinuity. 
So for short, we call it the MOHO discontinuity. That's pretty standard in geology among anyone, uh, any kind of geologist calls it the MOHO. There would be a fundamental benefit for us getting down that far, and it would be that there could be some new uh, or enriched elements or materials that we could use, including ores or other types of semi-precious or precious metals or gemstones, so forth. And so we want to get down to the Mahovric discontinuity to see what the boundary marker between the crust and the upper mantle have to offer us. So that's for test related question. Understand that the MOHO represents the boundary between the upper mantle and the lower crust. The Gutenberg discontinuity uh, exists way deep inside the earth, way about 2,900 kilometers beneath our feet, where the lower mantle touches the outer core. There's a composition change there. That's where S waves deflect off of the, in, uh, of the core and P waves continue to travel through. So that's how we know the inside of the Earth has two different components in terms of core being an, an inner solid core and a liquid outer core. So what's the big deal about the core? For test related purposes, I, I'm going to be really focusing on the percent of the uh, Earth's mass and if there's something important about its characteristics like its age or, um, or its composition, but I'm not as worried about temperature and depth amounts. That's for your flavor. But the core is probably the most important part of the Earth's interior, and here's why. Because it fuels up every bit of plate tectonics. So where does the uh, heat come from the core? The core's heat comes from the radioactive decay of radioactive uh, elements like um, nickel and iron, uranium, um, thorium, items like that. Nevertheless, these uh, radioactive materials have been uh, breaking down ever since the core actually assimilated into what we call a dynamo earth back in the beginning days of the earth's history in the Hadean e um, era of the Precambrian Eon. So the earth's core makes up 16% of the mass, and remember there's two parts, an inner solid core and an outer liquid core. So why is that such an important dynamic of having an inner solid core and an outer liquid core? If this hand represents uh, the inner solid core, the liquid core spins around it. As it spins around it, it creates a magnetic field. When you begin to think about the significance of that, uh, that is important for a number of reasons because it helps produce magnetism for our planet and helps us keep our, solar sis our uh, atmosphere from flying out into the solar system. That's very important to life surviving on Earth. So we know that the inner and the outer core relationship is very important for the long-term benefits of any kind of living organisms on a planet. So essentially, if our inner core finally runs out of radioactive decay materials, we'll end up like Mars. So the Earth's mantle is where all the action happens. There's three parts to it. I'd like you to assume that uh, it's kind of like a Stromboli, if you've ever had one of those at a really great Italian restaurant where it's kind of like a big football and there's a bottom pizza dough, there's the cheesy good stuff in the middle, and then there's a top uh, part of the football. And the Earth's mantle is like that. It has a rigid bottom, a rigid top, and all the good stuff's in the middle. So uh, we're going to talk about each piece and its composition because that matters to what happens at the surface. All right, the lower mantle makes up literally a majority of the Earth's volume of the uh, interior of the Earth that we have. It's composed of very solid, rigid rock, and it's very mafic, if not ultramafic, pretty a type to be exa uh, exact, which is an ultramafic equivalent of what granite would be in the felsic category. So this stuff is uh, was formed at the inception of the Earth's uh, development and it hasn't remelted and so that makes up the minerals that are going to kind of float up to the next level, the asthenosphere. So that means the asthenosphere should be very mafic and by now you know what mafic means. If not, you need to go back and review igneous rocks or the igneous rock chapter. All right, the asthenosphere, that's where all the action happens. This is where convection actually moves that plastic flowing rock and occasionally you get what you see on uh, your screen here where those red uh, bubbles are starting to come up like a lava lamp. Well, those are where less dense rock starts to rise as mantle plumes to the surface. And if you look at the darker green above the lime green color, sherbet lime green, there you'll see a red hot spot where it's labeled hot spot. 
and understand that that's cooking the very top of the mantle, which is part of the crust, and that's called the lithosphere. So hot spots, most of them are generated in the asthenosphere. Most of them that originate towards the base of the asthenosphere are extremely mafic, because keep in mind, the lower part of the mantle is ultra mafic. All right, let's get to the lithosphere. This gets a little confusing because people are like, well, the lithosphere is the crust where we are, only part of it. Half of it's made up of the top layer of the mantle. And remember, there's a boundary marker between the top layer of the mantle and our crust called the moho. So that boundary marker is extremely important, the moho discontinuity. So that upper layer of the stromboli is rigid. That's called the lithosphere. And that part of the mantle is extremely mafic. This is broken up just like the plates that we have at the surface because they are a combined unit. And then they float on top of the asthenosphere. That's why when we have melting of the crust, it's coming from the upper layer of the mantle. And usually that's why we have mafic mantle plumes that cook different parts of the Earth's crust. All right, if you take a look in your book, they're in several different pages, but um, I can know probably page 39 is your best bet because it has lots and lots of pictures, but there's several. There's one in chapter one and one in chapter two, one of these maps. But the bottom line is all the plates on the planet are cracked up, for better lack of words, and they crack up because of heat spots or hot spots that come up and cook seams and make the plates very weak and they begin to separate. So once a plate separates, eventually it moves and it will collide into something else, creating a collision point like a subduction zone. All right, so that brings me to the top of the Earth's uh, interior. That's called the upper lithosphere. The upper lithosphere is made up of both oceanic and continental crust. This only makes up 1% of the Earth's mantle, or I mean the Earth's mass. So if you take a look at the mass of the core, the mantle, and the crust, it equals 100%. You're like, well, I don't remember what the mantle was. Let's go back and take a look. First of all, let's just take 100% minus 1. That leaves us 99% because we're looking at the crust right now. And the Earth's core was 16%. So that brings 100 minus 17%. That's 83% left over for the mantle. Make sure you don't confuse that 83% with the 88% of geologic time that the Precambrian Eon makes up. So there's two types of up, upper lithosphere, which we call the crust. There is continental and oceanic crust. All right, first of all, don't get in the habit of kind of boxing in continental and oceanic crust simply because one's on a continent and one's underwater. It doesn't work that way. It has to do with composition. Composition of the crust dictates whether you're looking at continental or oceanic. You have to assume and understand that continental crust extends into the ocean as a continental shelf until it pinches out and it hits what's called the ocean floor, which is made of a completely different material. We didn't know that until after World War II. And when we started poking holes in the bottom of the ocean floor through the deep sea drilling program and taking a look at the composition of rock. So let's get to the important aspects of continental crust. First, it's extremely thick. I'd like to think of it like thick styrofoam that you get when you buy a TV or something, and it's really, really thick. It's very light, uh, light in color. It's while it may be rock solid and made out of granite or a granitic type of materials, its density is less than the ocean crust. That's extremely important. Even though it's really thick, the density is less. And so it doesn't sink when two plates collide. Subsequently, the age of continental crust is much, much young, uh, much, much older, excuse me, than what you would see with oceanic crust. The oldest continental rocks are somewhere around 3.8 billion years old, and we might get lucky and find one that's around 4.0 billion years old. There's one place in the world, in Australia, they think they've found that, and one place in Greenland area, and even one place in Canada. So um, we know that the oldest rocks that are exposed at the surface of the Earth are Precambrian in age, and they're all on continents. None of them are found on ocean basins. So thickness is important. The thickest continental crust would be under a mountain range like the Himalayas, Mount Everest, for example, where you got really thick crust where the crust is upheavaled. The thinnest crust is going to be at that continental shelf that I mentioned earlier. So that poses some problems for drilling for us for things uh, for trying to get to the Moho because continental crust is pretty thick. All right, on oceanic crust, what's the most important part of that? The oceanic crust is very thin in comparison to continental crust, but extremely dense. 
that density makes it sink under uh, a continental crust, causing what we call a subduction zone, where one plate goes underneath another. So that subduction zone helps fuel the rock cycle that we'll be getting to shortly. So not only is it more dense and that it's thin, it is also extremely young in comparison to continental crust. The absolute oldest oceanic crust in the entire globe to currently is 180 million, not billion, million. So I told you that the continental crust was up to 3.8 billion years. That's a really radical difference. That means we're losing oceanic crust at subduction. It's getting remelted and refuels the rock cycle and comes right back up to the surface in the forms of magma and lava. So that kind of shows that illustration here. If you look where it says mid-oceanic ridge uh, on your diagram, I'll put my cursor there and let you see right in this area, right in here. What will happen is this area that I'm kind of wiggling on here, that's going to separate because of a hot spot. In other words, the crust gets really hot, it begins to become weak, it fractures, and it starts to pull in either direction. That's going to make this side head towards the continent over here. As this oceanic plate that I'm using my mouth with, or mouse with, uh, subducts, it's going to make a deep sea trench right where you see this uh, marker here. So that trench is always on the oceanic side of the subduction zone. Then you can see mountains and what you see as volcanoes that are active, and they're active because the ocean plate gets deep enough where it begins to remelt, sends mantle plumes in the form of hot spots up to the surface, turning on volcanoes. That recycles the rock that was here, down through here, gets hot, remelts, and comes up to the surface, creating new rock at the surface. So this is constantly going on until the plate tectonics engine ceases to operate when the radioactive uh, elements in the core no longer have any heat. All right, let's get into the definition of a rock and then we will um, take a look at the three different types of rock. This should be a review for you. Uh, if it's not, let's go back and take a look at each type of uh, rock that we have and you'll be able to identify the differences between igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rock. First of all, rocks are consolidated, meaning they're together aggregates of minerals, rock material, fragments of even organic uh, material sometimes if there's some kind of tree or leafy material in there, but most of the time it's inorganic matter. Aggregate means different pieces of stuff put together. So you got to have it put together as consolidated and it's got to be hardened. That's what lithification is. And it's an aggregate of different things stuck together. If it was an unconsolidated aggregate, it would be soil. So that's one of the qualifiers for looking at the difference between uh, unconsolidated and consolidated aggregates of materials determines whether you have soil or you have a rock. There are so many minerals found on Earth. Currently, there's well over 3,500 minerals, really closer to 5,000 that have been uh, identified. The good news is there's really only about several dozen that are super common. So what is the rock cycle and why do you need to know about it? The rock cycle kind of takes all three types of rocks and explains how their origins can change and why the rock may have a series of histories that go with it, personalities for a better lack of words. So the rock cycle actually is a sequence of rocks turning in from igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic in no specific order, I might add, and constantly recycling and changing based on earth processes that happen inside and above the earth's surface. The guy that came up with this concept is this person right here. This is James Hutton, who's also the father of modern geology. He also ranks as the title for the father of the rock cycle. That would be a great test question. So the rock cycle, um, he didn't know about radioactive heating uh, of the Earth's interior. That was well before James Hutton's time. Now we understand what James Hutton knew to be true with his farm in Scotland, that rocks are, are interconnected, that they have a long history, and that they probably haven't all been the same throughout history. All right, the rock cycle involves the recognition of three different types of rocks. Igneous always starts the rock cycle, guaranteed quest, test question, and of the test question, it's gonna ask what type of igneous rock? It's magma. Couldn't be lava because lava is solidified magma. Magma happens first. It's the roots of fueling any kind of rock cycle. So let's take a look at these characteristics of each rock type. 
see what makes them igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic, and also remember to focus on the texture terms for each classification of rock, because igneous has its own texture terms, metamorphic has its own too, and then sedimentary has its own two uh, types of delineations that we use or terms that we classify for texture. So we're going to start with igneous since it's the beginning of the rock cycle, and keep in mind the rock cycle always starts with magma. Okay. All right, so igneous rocks are molten rock. There's two types, there's magma and lava. Those terms really are not interchangeable. Magma is intrusive, it means inside the earth. Mag uh, lava is the extrusive equivalent of that. So in igneous terms, we have a magmatic rock like granite, that's felsic, and then we have an extrusive equivalent, that's the lava-based rock called rhyolite. So we have that for, or for felsic, intermediate, mafic, and ultramafic. So determining whether an igneous rock is intrusive or extrusive has to do with this. Intrusive rocks cool very slowly, literally over millions of years. Extrusive rocks can cool in days and hours. So the amount of time that a nuclei of uh, a mineral has to grow is very short for extrusive, so you see very fine-grained texture, known as aphanitic. However, in a Igneous rock where you have phaneritic texture, the crystals are big because they have a chance to grow over time because it takes millions of years to cool that rock off. So where it cools determines if you have a plutonic, a.k.a. intrusive, or if you have an extrusive, a.k.a. volcanic rock. So in this picture, you'd be looking at volcanic rocks, obviously. This is from Hawaii. And you can see an active lava flow right there. I took that uh, come looking down from a helicopter and you can totally see how dark and mafic that would be. So this would have an extrusive origin. Volcanic means the same thing. And you see where it says right here where the mouse is moving aphanitic texture. Aphanitic texture simply refers to that the lava cooled fast on the surface of the earth. Then we have to classify, did it fall as a felsic intermediate mafic or ultra mafic chemistry? The chemistry simple, simply is related to the percentage of silica that is uh, in that lava or magma. That qualifies whether it is felsic, intermediate, mafic, or ultramafic. So intrusive igneous rocks cool for a very long stretch of time. Thus, they have interlocking crystals. So the interlocking crystals happen because it took a long time for that rock to cool, like granite or like gabbro in the mafic department, or like diorite in the intermediate uh, category. All right, let's look at metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks are any kind of rock, whether sedimentary, igneous, or another metamorphic rock that's undergone heat and or pressure in which you have a change to the rock, but you haven't melted it. If you melt it, you're out of the metamorphic category and you're back into igneous. So let's see what happens here. There's two primary types with the third more rare type. The most common type is regional, where you get a long, an, a long area like a mountain range area. The Sierra Nevadas might be an example, or all the mountains in Colorado. That would be regional metamorphism. And then contact metamorphism is more along the lines where a magma chamber is heating up rocks. So either one produces a specific type of look to a metamorphic rock, which qualifies it as either foliated or non-foliated texture. So let's take a look at that. This one right here would just be heating up the exterior part of that magma chamber. This rock around it would be heated but not melted. That would be called contact metamorphism. Examples of metamorphic rock that could do that would be uh, quartz sandstone would turn into quartzite or limestone uh, metamorphosing into uh, marble. Over here, you can see the wavy look to these crystals. That's because they got squashed and compressed in some kind of uh, mountain building event typically that's going to be caused by regional metamorphism and we call this type of texture foliated so I'd ask you which one of these pictures is foliated which one is non foliated take a second to think and ponder that hmm. foliated would look like the crystals have been aligned all in a parallel fashion so if your answer was the upper left you are absolutely correct and this one down here, you don't see that same pattern. Instead, it looks like a mosaic, almost like a granite pattern, where the crystals have been glued together because it's been heated but not completely melted. That would be non-foliated texture. So here's some examples of common metamorphic rocks. We got pink granite that's squashed and turns into pink nice. 
you get shale or mudstone and it turns into slate. Sandstone gets metamorphosed into quartzite. Now remember each of these rocks will either be foliated or non-foliated and certain rocks are always in one category like nice is always foliated, slate is always foliated, and quartzite almost every time should be non-foliated. So when it comes to test related questions there's a couple of parent rocks that are really important. The one for sand, uh, quartz sandstone turning into quartzite and limestone or dolostone aka dolomite turning into marble. All right, let's move into sedimentary rocks because that's the stuff you're the most familiar with. These are rocks that at the Earth's surface get weathered down and deposited into new rock layers called sedimentary rock layers. So sedimentary rock layers are always going to be made from pre-existing rock. So they're the youngest of the three in terms of, of how the rock cycle originally was made. So you had to have the igneous stuff first, it would solidify, then we would start uh, weathering and erosion processes. So sedimentary rocks form at the Earth's surface, but they can be buried as layers till if ultimately they get deep enough to be metamorphosed and or even melted by igneous processes. So we take a mountain, we weather those sediments down. Erosion is the transportation process. Those sediments, as they erode, got to be deposited somewhere. So let's say it gets deposited at a beach or in a lake, something like that. Well, obviously, you're not going to cause cementation in sedimentary rocks in a concrete check like this. However, having said that, um, we can do that in the Earth's crust very easily. So cementation and compaction lead to the hardening process. You will not have a sedimentary rock until you've lithified it, which means hardened. So those five steps must happen in order to create a sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rocks have two different categories. One is chemical for its texture and one is clastic, aka detrital. Detrital means exactly the same thing as clastic. All clastic rocks are, which is most all sedimentary rocks, are fragments and pieces of other rocks stuck together. The delineation of shale, siltstone, sandstone, conglomerate, or breccia is determined on the class size that you see. Over here in the chemical department, these are where waters are, are minerals are dissolved in water or a chemical precipitate reaction occurs to create them. So they're, the materials that make up the rock fabric itself is actually generated a completely different way instead of being from the breakdown of pre-existing rock. So common chemical rocks would be things like limestones, uh, dolostones, cherts, those kinds of things. All right, where do I have rocks in Texas? everywhere, but let's show you where we have most of our igneous and metamorphic rock. Right here would be the Llano Uplift, and then out in Big Bend National Park we get quite a bit of igneous and metamorphic rock over there. There's a handful way out here, but most of this blue represents Paleozoic aged rock. The green right in here represents Cretaceous, and all of this orange and yellow you see is Cenozoic. So, um, we have sedimentary rocks everywhere, and because of that, we have a very rich amount of uh, resources economically, things like oil and gas, things like coal, things like um, sand and gravel deposits that it provide economic resources and value, intrinsic value for, uh, for us. So let's close this up by learning about how all three of those rocks fit together as the rock cycle. Rock cycle means this, that a rock simply changes form and can go from, let's say, an igneous lava flow, hardens and weathers down into a lava flow, and that lava flow gets weathered by wind and water and ice and breaks down and makes a sandstone unit that's sedimentary. That sedimentary rock gets subducted into the mantle and gets metamorphosed. Now, eventually you don't you can't make metamorphic rock because it gets too hot. So that's really around 55 kilometers. So there's a pretty narrow window of opportunity for metamorphic rocks. Well, let's say I had a metamorphic rock and it got too deep and it turned into an igneous rock. That could be a change. Or an igneous rock kind of gets shoved a little bit higher up into the mantle, but not at the surface. It may get metamorphosed. So it could be that a rock changes its cycle over and over and over again. Certain minerals tell us that, like zircons. We can actually see sequences of changes to those rocks. That's pretty cool. So this turtle is in Hawaii taking a break on a black sand beach. Now let's think about uh, the origins of this beach. The beach would be a lava, which was igneous, 
it's breaking down into sand, so it's going to turn into a sandstone, which would be sedimentary rock. And ultimately, that sedimentary rock could either be re-weathered and deposited as another sedimentary rock, or it may get shoved down at a subduction zone and turned into igneous or metamorphic rock. So everything's connected, and it really is when it's coming down to the rock cycle. I want to show you one last thing that's part of your assignment, and that's to go to this website right here and run through the simulation of how the rock cycle works. This will kind of put all the pieces together of you seeing how subduction creates volcanism and where metamorphic rocks are made, where igneous rocks are made, and where sedimentary rocks are made. We will see you at the next lecture, and you have a great day. Bye.